I'm Leon Wieseltier. I sit at the Brookings Institution and do a variety of things, and I'm starting a journal, etc. cetera. Um, this is my beloved friend and comrade, Drew Faust, one of the great American historians, whose book, The Republic of Suffering, if you haven't read, you must read. It is one of the darkest and most beautiful books ever written about this country. She also happens to be the president of Harvard. Um, and we're here to discuss something that we've discussed privately many times. Basically, you're going to overhear a conversation between friends about the state of American culture. And our subject today is the fate of the humanities, which is a dour subject, declining enrollments, declining budgets, declining cultural prestige, and so on. Drew is, uh, since she is at Harvard, she has, knows more of the where, where, as it were, where all the bodies really are buried in this, in this crisis. But I think we should begin, I think, by establishing that the declining prestige of the humanities in the United States really is nothing less than a cultural crisis. Wouldn't you say that? I would agree. I would agree. Though it is really encouraging to see so many people here at 9 o'clock in the morning to think about this question. So that's, that's reassuring true, yes. in itself. Those of you who thought we were going to talk about some new app, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Leon, I wonder if it might be useful for me to say a few words, bringing numbers into this at the Always. outset, if I may, uh, just to outline some of the ways we can look at the dimensions of mm -hmm. the problem around particularly um, college enrollments and choice of college majors. Because we see some interesting developments in the years since World War II. At the end of World War II, about nationwide, about 11% of students chose to major in humanities. And then this went up in the 1960s to about 17%, close to 17%. And it's since fallen down to 6%. How do we understand that? What was going on? An important question. But let me tell you some Harvard numbers uh, first. We currently have about 14% of our undergraduates choose to major in the humanities. Um, this is down from about 25% when I became president of Harvard, which was only nine years ago. Uh, we see a huge increase in the number of students choosing to major in science, and that seems to be the, the movement. Movement also out of social sciences uh, into science. We do, however, see um, a lot of students, we only introduced majors, uh, minors at Harvard <clears throat> in 2007. And as the numbers of majors in humanities have gone down, there has been an, uh, a choice by a number of students to take a minor in the humanities, to major in either social sciences or sciences, and then choose a minor in the humanities. So the 14%. Guilty, guilty minors. Guilty minors. Mm -hmm. Students who are driven, I think, by what is behind an awful lot of this, which is a conception of vocationalism that has defined the humanities out. But just to go back to those national numbers, the eight, uh, 1948 to the present numbers, the up and then down, a lot of this seems to be related to the increasing numbers of women in higher education who initially were humanities majors, and then in the years since the 60s have increasingly spread out across um, the variety of fields. So that's not an entirely terrible thing if you're opening up freedom of choice. It used to be that about 27% of women, this would be in 1948, majored in humanities fields, and now only about 11%. So still more women than men choose humanities, but there's been a sharp drop off that has contributed to the overall decline. And then just one other um, statistic people ask me about a lot, which is, so if people aren't majoring in humanities or even minoring in humanities, are they taking humanities classes? And we can see significant declines in the numbers of enrollments in humanities classes. Since 2007, when I became president, about a 10% decline in the numbers of students taking humanities classes. So we can see a lot of different kinds of trends going on here, yeah. but they're not good they're in, not in good. terms of what you're I talking about. I think you said something. You used the word vocationalism. Mm -hmm. I think that opens up one larger observation about our culture that, or our society that may help to explain what's happening. Uh, it's, in my view, the United States is becoming more of 
a transactional and instrumental society than it's ever been. Um, you know, the smartest question you could ask about anything in this country right now is not is it true or false or good or evil or beautiful or ugly, but how does it work, right? Everything is about technique and technicality. This has something to do with the ascendance of technology, obviously, and the mentality that it subliminally teaches. Uh, but I think that what we need to do is to recognize the limitations of that mentality and to recognize that even though the job prospects for humanities students may be good or bad or worsening or improving in various conditions and so on, the purpose of the humanities is not utilitarian. It is not primarily to get a job. And one of the terrible things when you read about the decline of the humanities in the media, people rise up to defend the humanities and they always, or most of them do so, on utilitarian grounds so that um, a, th a theater restores a neighborhood, so isn't that good? Or English majors get lots of jobs at McKinsey, so isn't that good? Mm -hmm. When in fact, the purpose of the humanities is to cultivate the individual and to cultivate the citizen for intrinsic reasons for intrinsic reasons. I mean, if you look, for example, at our political life right now, which is a very um, heartbreaking thing to behold, um, one of the things you realize even more, I realize even more powerfully than before, is that is the enormity of the intellectual responsibility that a republic of opinion imposes on ordinary citizens. In other words, we are a republic of opinion. Basically, we govern ourselves by tallying what we think about things, um, either in elections or in obsessive polling and so on. And what this means is that the quality of American opinion formation has a lot to do with the quality of American democracy. So for example, if one is worried about the quality of American democracy and all of us should be up at night losing sleep about the quality of American democracy now. Any instruction that teaches young people how to think rationally and how to think empathetically and how to imagine themselves in the situations of others, all these things that are taught not by biology and physics and chemistry and God help us economics, um, you know, we live in a society in which the greatest, most esteemed authorities on human happiness are economists. I mean, is there any subject less fit for economists than the subject of human happiness, <laughs> right? I mean, um, but the fact is that the human, if one wants to be instrumental, at least about the quality of our politics and our society, the humanities become more essential. So I was going to say, you end up with a utilitarian argument there. You say you in can't. The, up to that didn't point. You? Up yes. to that point, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm moving into the radical Dante ish argument. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. Because yeah. when you were saying the humanities are being kind of hijacked as a utilitarian or um, transactional. Um, for utilitarian and transactional purposes, that, that that is an inadequate justification. I'd widen what you say to say this is a danger for education mm -hmm. and how we see the whole purpose of education. Mm -hmm. And I often can advance the same arguments for the liberal arts, which in my mind include the sciences, the social sciences, mm -hmm. the humanities, the arts, not just the humanities. That also is under tremendous mm -hmm. scrutiny and criticism because it doesn't seem to point directly towards a particular vocational slot. A practical I mean, result. we in higher yeah. education were charged by the federal government several years ago to uh, develop a, uh, an ability to report on our success as educators based on salary of graduates at first job. This made mm. me go berserk because mm. the last thing we measure our right. success by is what a person does the first year out of college. First of all, many things that we value intensely never are going to be the most remunerative things. And secondly, we educate students for a lifetime, not for one single job. We want them to have the capacities yeah. of mind that will enable them to think about their fifth job or their tenth job. And so how we think about what education is for, the question of education and citizenship, the question of having critical faculties that, in the words of a former um, dean of Harvard College, uh, unfortunately now deceased, he'd say, an education is to enable you to understand when someone's talking rot. 
Mm -hmm. And yeah. to have that kind of sense of, and especially in an age where we're bombarded with information, yeah, that is even more important to be able to distinguish what yeah. is a good argument, what is a preposterous argument, what is a use That's of evidence, right. That's right. how is language being deployed in ways that you need to unwrap. Well, you, again, you, when you, you're exactly <laughs> right, and you make me want to um, raise something that I think has a lot to do with this, both with the fate of the humanities and as a reminder of why the humanities are the standpoint from which to resist many of the most deleterious uh, ways of thinking in our society right now. I think that right now American society is suffering from a plague of quantification, or rather of misplaced quantification. Uh, you, for example, just gave a number about, uh, an example of a number that measures nothing significant. We are, owing to the numbers that are generated by our devices, even as we speak and sleep, I mean, owing to this thing called big data, we have now decided that everything will have a quantitative metric, right? Now, this, I think, as a society, we now have to deal with the question of what can a number capture and what can a number not capture? because it turns out that many of the deepest and most essential experiences of life cannot be numerically measured, cannot be numerically measured. Uh, and when institutions begin to apply this mistake, terrible things can happen. I learned not too long ago that the way museum, if a museum now wants to, is considering mounting a major Rembrandt retrospective or a major Titian retrospective, the way they go about it is to try to arrive at the number of what it would cost dollars per visitor, which is insane because we know that a major Rembrandt or Titian retrospective is basically planting a seed in a culture and in, and in the eyes and minds of everyone who attends it. I remember years ago, um, I'll tell a little tale, at my old magazine that was destroyed, I was, um, I was walking along past some of the young people who worked there, and one of them, I overheard one say to the other the following sentence. He said, well, she ran into my friend last night and told him that she loved me, which I think is an important data point. <laughs> so I very rudely, um, walked into the little pen there and I said, young man, I promise I won't do this often, but, and I'm not gonna pry into your personal affairs, I just want to insist that the fact that she loves you is not a data point. <laughs> and if you would like to discuss this with me later, I can tell you exactly why not. And so we had this discussion, it was very illuminating for the young man, and I congratulated him on the fact that she loved him. <laughs> um, but I think that this, I, you know, the idea that everything needs, the human, what the humanities teaches, what literature and art and music and philosophy and history teaches is that the, the correct description and analysis of human life is not a scientistic affair. And the imperialism of the sciences that we're now experiencing in some way, this phenomenon that scientism which is the opposite of science. Real scientists don't practice scientism. But the ideologists of science would like everyone to believe that the answer to every important question in life has a, is a scientific answer. The humanities disprove that spectacularly, as does ordinary human life, as does everyday experience. You know, I just want to insert a wonderful quote that's attributed to Einstein, though some say he didn't say it, which is, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Perfect. And that seems to capture. I hope capture, you did say it. Yes, yes. That seems to capture yeah. much of, of what you're saying. Leon, I want to ask you, though, how we deal with something that I confront all the time when I make these arguments for the humanities, which is people will respond by saying, oh, you're president of Harvard. That's easy to say. And when you're in a situation in which the students are not likely, as likely to get wonderful jobs mm -hmm. as, you know, regardless of what they've done in college. Um, it's a harder argument. Well, and I'll tell and you. so you've written recently about the humanities in this era of, I'd say, enhanced resentment of elitism. How do we make these arguments in a way that doesn't make it just seem like part of what the 
reaction so, is so powerfully being developed? Well, I think against? the first thing that has to be shown to people, especially young people, that the merit of an idea has nothing to do with its origins or its provenance. Mm -hmm. In other words, the fact that um, E equals MC squared was developed by a white Jew does not make it a white Jewish idea. And the same is true with reason and democracy and freedom and all sorts of ideas who, who, which are dismissed or bracketed because people are now so much more interested in the social provenance of things, uh, which means that we have to learn to make an unironic argument for universalism to start with. Um, secondly, and this is where it gets, I think, really moving, the fact is that humanistic understandings are more essential for people in trouble than for people not in trouble. I mean, it's the, you know, us allegedly privileged people who, you know, are not in Syria and have not fought in the Spanish Civil War and are not suffering famine or extreme poverty or are not being shot at by cops or stopped on the street or so on. For us, this may seem like the, like, the, you know, a, an almost aesthetic kind of cultivation mm -hmm. of the individual like a luxury, but people in adversity who suffer hardship of various kinds actually have to think philosophically, whether they call it that or not. And they do it all the time because they have to, because they have to. They turn to literature, they turn to song, they turn to art. You know, people in trouble do not turn to regression analysis. <laughs> they really don't. They really don't. And you know, you know this, you've written about You've written about the American South in the 19th mm -hmm. century, about slave culture. Mm -hmm. When one looks at slave culture, and the, when one reads the things that you've written and that Herb Gutman and all the other people mm -hmm. wrote, what they, they basically turned to the humanities mm -hmm. because that their, their souls required the fortification and the wisdom that only the humanistic understandings mm -hmm. could provide. So in a strange sort of way, um, it's precisely people who fear that life will be harder for them than for others, who should be shown that, that they need this. They need this. I mean, you know, philosophy basically, in some way, philosophy developed out of two things. One, a wonder at the universe, and two, a need to explain suffering. I mean, those are the two roots of, uh, and literature the same mm -hmm. in a way. So I think it's not, it's not hard to make that argument. And in my experience, when you expose young people to a genuinely exciting humanistic instruction, when you actually sit them down and put them in front of Dante and Beatrice or Shakespeare, mm -hmm. it's not a problem. It really, if you pardon the vulgarity, it sells itself. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think we need to attend to that necessity. Absolutely, because absolutely. Because just going back to the dread numbers I mentioned at yeah. the beginning, the discrepancy between the decline at Harvard and the decline elsewhere is marked. I mean, we have a decline, but the national decline is much greater. And a lot of hard-pressed public institutions, the first thing they're chopping off is the French department. Absolutely. So the public necessity of the humanities is an important obligation for all of us who have any devotion to the, to the humanities. And That's right, and, pe but, and also people need, people mm -hmm. need to understand things like sensibility and um, the mysteries of life, if you will, though that's a sloppy expression and so on, not just for the purpose of becoming citizens, but for the purpose of becoming husbands and wives and lovers mm -hmm. and parents mm -hmm. and sons and daughters mm -hmm. and friends. And, and, and these are roles that know no social boundaries of mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. class and or economic yeah. situation. But this I will use as a justification for arguments I make that are very utilitarian about the humanities. Because if you can get someone to adopt it because they think oh, it might be some good for them, and then they find the intrinsic worth of it, I it. think that, that has Well, the purpose. rabbis have an old statement that mm -hmm. from studying the Torah not for its own sake, you come to study the Torah for its own sake. Exactly. It's, exactly. That, it's that sort yeah. of thing. Um, but again, it's um, people have, I, you're right, the problem is that the humanities, and by the way, we're talking about the humanities. We haven't yet discussed some of the damage to the humanities that contemporary humanists have done. We, I mean, there, there's a lot of blame to go around. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of blame to go around. But um, the, the humanities are just about the most universal language imaginable. People speak it all the time. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it. Um, 
I mean, one of the utilitarian purposes I see is one that you would frame slightly differently, I think, but it seems to me that the humanities are such an important vehicle for widening a world, for seeing through other people's eyes, through literature or through Absolutely. reading the history of other people's experiences, and developing a kind of empathy for people outside yourself. Absolutely. And in this time of increasing tribalism, this seems to me such a critical role. I just, actually, I just published something exactly mm -hmm. about this. I mean, mm -hmm. people, we have been raised by this, on the stuff, you know, Plato, Rousseau, Tolstoy, others, have taught people that there's some antithesis between art and morality, when in fact there can't be such an antithesis because um, the imagination is essential for moral action. Because unless one can imagine predicaments other than one's own, one would never act to mm -hmm. alleviate or to mm -hmm. remediate those predicaments. We would all be narcissists. Mm -hmm. And the only cure for not the narcissism that comes of the natural parochialism of inherited circumstances, right? None of us are born mm -hmm. universal creatures. We are all born into a particular tradition with particular limitations. The only thing that corrects for that is empathy. The only thing that creates empathy is imagination. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that schools and trains the imagination mm -hmm. are the arts and the humanities. Um, so in a, in a sense, art is a foundation of empathetic mm -hmm. ethical action, mm -hmm. a very foundation for it. It's not a feat and it's not elite, uh, even though some of the people who teach it um, wear suits that are way too expensive. But I mean, but the fact is that it is, it is that fundamental, I think. I would agree with you completely. Mm -hmm. And I argue to those very captured by the notion of innovation that it, innovation is also based in an understanding that things can be different from the way they are now. And I see that as one of the fundamental purposes of history, which is my field, to make people see contingency in the past. Things are not the way they are by fiat. People made choices. Mm -hmm. So how can you use that understanding to think beyond your own world and to think of the choices and the implications that, of those choices in your own time? Well, we know from recent work in the history of science and the philosophy of science that even scientists have now come to understand the role of the imagination oh, yeah. in science. It's not just step after step mm -hmm. after step. Mm -hmm. There are flashes of intuition. Mm -hmm. There are flashes and of creativity and in creativity. Both these realms. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much. Going back to your um, comments about the obsession with quantification, I think about the outcome of the humanities and our uh, concern with measuring outcomes mm -hmm. in our society. And it seems to me that the outcome of the humanities is so often not an answer but a question, mm -hmm. a new question. And there's a wonderful quote I came across from Picasso that I put up on my desk which says, um, he says, computers are useless, they only give you answers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was fascinating because we've got to know what's the next question we well, want to absolutely. ask of them in order to take advantage of them. But how do we get to be a society or a world that is more comfortable with the notion of generating questions. Well, I think we have to become a society that is more comfortable with living in the circum in circum in intellectual circumstances of uncertainty and inconclusiveness. I think that's what's happened in our society owing to the immediate intellectual gratifications such as they are of Google uh, and owing to the technology, we have lost, we, know, we cannot tolerate not knowing something for very long. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that's happened as a consequence of the technology is that all knowledge has in some way been reduced to the status of information, right? So that if you want to know whether God exists, you can Google it, and if you want to know my zip code, you can Google it. But it's all there. When in fact, information is a highly inferior form of knowledge. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a, a, a ninth century Jewish philosopher wrote a very famous philosophical treatise in Iraq. And, and in the preface, he asked a perfectly obvious question. He said, if God wanted to know, us to know the answers to all these questions, why didn't he just tell us? <laughs> and the answer he gave is because if God had just told us these answers, strictly speaking, we wouldn't have known them. What he meant was that knowledge requires inquiry, method, and above all, time. And we, have, we are waging a war on time. The goal of our culture now is to abolish time. And without time and without the ability to live in gray areas and inconclusively and slowly make one's way to things, we'll always be, at, first of all, at the mercy of demagogues 
who solve the, you know, who, who immediately gratify us too, but also will be at the mercy of easy answers and this impatience with questions that you describe. It's, I think, I see this everywhere. It's a terrifically deep problem now. Say more about this question of time in the humanities, because I believe that hurrying everything up has been very detrimental for oh. the traditions of humanistic inquiry. Absolutely. And one of the things that many faculty in the humanities at Harvard have said to me is that students don't have the same patience for long, extensive reading. You've talked about snackable yeah. uh, bits of reading in, in some of your writings, but how, do you see this as a reality, and are these things correlated, and how do we recapture Well, I regard that? art, there, there, are, there are a number of standpoints for resistance against the acceleration of everything. Nature is one, um, the body is another, and art is a third. For example, there is no way you can accelerate an experience of art. I mean, if you sit down for a Mahler symphony, you've got to be patient with it. You can't fast forward it. Now you can walk out. Play it on 78 you can, well, but, this is, but then you don't hear it. <laughs> but then you don't hear it, you see. I remember many years ago at my magazine, John Updike, I asked John Updike to review a retrospective of War, about Warhol at the Museum of Modern Art. And John wrote a piece in which he described Warhol's art as art for busy people. And, my, and I liked the fact that he said that. I didn't like the fact that he meant it as a compliment. But <laughs> I, liked, I liked that he said it because he was putting his finger on something. Mm -hmm. That's right. The thing about a Warhol painting is you can take it in in a glance and then practice the ultimate American practice, which is move on, right? Mm -hmm. That's the sacred American act, is to move on. And I think that the different realms of life in which we live each have their own temporality. In other words, things do not all progress at the same pace. And whereas it's possible for the sake of that almighty American value convenience to accelerate all sorts of things without damage to the psyche or the culture or the society, there are things that if you accelerate them, you damage them. Mm -hmm. You damage them. Uh, and so, yes, I think that, that, what we, that one of the things the humanities can teach, which makes them are spectacularly countercultural. The idea that the humanities are traditional, as far as I'm concerned right now, they're about as transgressive and revolutionary as you can get, um, is that they are lessons in that the old art of, pa of patience. We have a wonderful uh, professor of history of art at Harvard named Jennifer Roberts, and she wrote a piece for the Harvard Magazine last year on patience. Mm -hmm. and teaching with patients. And she has an assignment that she gives students in her art history course. They're to go to a museum and sit in front of a work of art for three hours. Mm. And when she tells them this, they just can't imagine it. No. They've never sat anywhere for three hours. And they're not allowed to use their devices Oh, they have. While They've sat sitting. in front of their computer yes, for three hours. Yes, but they're not allowed to do that. And she tells them, you know, at the end of one hour, write down what you've seen at two hours. And it is so illuminating for them because they realize that in hour three, they're seeing all kinds of things mm -hmm. that they had not noticed or understood in hour one. And so that, I think, is an introduction yeah. to what you're doing. But that about. has to do, as I say, the, the, the <laughs> largest rubric, not just for the discussion of the humanities, but for the discussion of our culture right now, I think, is this question of our war on time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, many philosophers, ancient and modern, have shown that human life is incomprehensible without understanding that it's temporal. In many, from Plato to Heidegger, we, we, we know this. And the abolition of time creates deformations, really mutilations mm -hmm. in human life. And so what we need to do, and again, the experience of nature can also provide that. But again, one needs the patience and the body. The experience of love can also provide that. There are certain standpoints, certain, op certain readouts. Uh, and I'm going to suggest another one, which both you and I have written about, yes. which is death. Well, yes. When I wrote a book about Mortality, death, yes. I was just astonished at the level of engagement from a general public mm -hmm. in thinking about the issue of mortality, of explaining death, of people in the past confronting death, and it gave me access to a community of people who were well beyond the academy that things I'd written before had never uh, reached. And it was so moving to, 
to have these interchanges with people, to feel that you were responding in some way to a need that could be addressed through reflection and scholarship. And I mean, you're, look, that's right. We Leon, need, as you all know, has also written a book about that. The, the humanities are necessary first and foremost mm -hmm. because we will all die. And it really is that simple at some point. This could be a great um, motto for our campaign. I think, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> well, I'm no, make death great again is what it will be. It's just, it's just. <laughs> but for that reason, the mo <laughs> I'm waiting for my hat. Yeah, exactly. Let's get some made, yes. But for that reason, the most sinister things that are happening at Google have precisely to do with the idea that this technological stuff is going at some point to actually liberate us from our mortality. People actually have the, the temerity to think, to tinker, to tinker with something so fundamental, not just to human life, but to the meaning of human life. Uh, you know, if we, I mean, many philosophers and artists have speculated about what it would be like if we weren't, if we didn't die. And almost unanimously, they discover that the urgency of human life is owed to the limit to its temporal limitations. You know, Janáček wrote a great opera called *The Macropolis Case*, a murder mystery that turns out to be about a 300-year-old woman, the, the heroine, the soprano, who in the 17th century drank a potion that gave her eternal life, and all the action in the opera turns to have been about her desperate attempt to find a way to die because life had become completely meaningless to her. She couldn't stand it anymore. Nothing mattered, nothing was urgent, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, um, yes, yes. And, and when one talks to ordinary people, when one pays shiva calls, when one goes to console mm -hmm. people on a death, when you listen to the things that people speak at such situations or at funerals, they are practicing humanists. Mm -hmm because they have to be, because they need meaning. And that's a question that will always remain a question. I hope so. I yeah, hope as so. As Melville says, I mean, it's the riddle of which the slain soul solvers Yes, are. but we should all live long, but none of us should live forever. <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely. But no one will ever have the answer. No one can tell you. Here's the that's right. precise answer, and our grandchildren will be asking this question. But it is extraordinary how stimulating, intellectually and artistically, the fact of our mortality mm -hmm. has been. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, you've written about this, I've written about this. When one focuses on this question, it carries one's mind to the most interesting places. Um, and, and all those places are humanistic places, mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm happy to say. Um, so you said a moment ago that you regarded the humanities as transgressive, not as traditional. Mm. Say more about that. Well, I, I like think that, that in this, is anything that teaches the art of waiting, anything that teaches respect for time, anything that teaches the inevitability of inconclusiveness and the humility that comes with working in the dark and slowly coming maybe towards an answer, um, anything that that teaches that efficiency and productivity and convenience are not the most sacred values for individuals or a society is, is the counterculture right now, mm -hmm. is the counterculture right now. Um, this defies the conventional wisdom of American society in the early 21st century. Um, it is heretical in some ways, it is heretical. Uh, that, by the way, is one of the reasons that I um, I think, by the way, that, again, that, that religion, when it's practiced mm -hmm. a certain way, when it's not practiced as a form of politics. I was thinking just as But religion is countercultural. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be countercultural. And, you know, the, the, the church and the shul and the mosque, whether the people who worship in those institutions know it or not, they are some of the places where some of the ancient questions of the humanities have gone to seek sanctuary, have gone to seek sanctuary mm -hmm. from Starbucks. <laughs> I mean, it's a... Uh... I was thinking a minute ago as you were speaking about the <clears throat> embrace of the Pope <clears throat> and how people have been so enthusiastic about Pope Francis because he does represent an alternative yes. to many of the values that you have been criticizing. Yes, and so a I think real that alternative. Has been, it has 
fed an appetite for something that the humanities ought to be able to help fill as yeah, well. Absolutely, and you know, John Paul II too, I mean, whatever, I mean, I'm, one has, one has views about the authoritarian structure of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church and so on, but no sooner had John Paul II helped bring about the death of communism than he turned on the dime and began his critique of capitalism. I mean, religion is deeply countercultural. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many of the people who lead religions in our country are not only not countercultural, they're opportunistic and would want to, get, want to get in the game, when in fact they represent the critique of the mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think the humanities are, they defy these platitudes and these cliches and these shibboleths. And, uh, you know, if uh, your professor your, of art history, if she got students to sit for three hours in front of a work of art, however complicated or uncomplicated it was, then she is a cultural hero, in my view. And she is a cultural hero because she taught people to unlearn habits. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of any better definition of true education than the unlearning of inherited habits or acquired habits. I mean, habits are exactly what we're supposed to question. You know, I mean, Woodrow Wilson, whom you're not allowed to quote anymore, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson once said that the purpose of a college education is to make a man as much unlike his father as possible. Right? Um, yes, yes. Um, That's great. I, will. I know, and therefore I offer you all my condolences upon the situation at your all the campuses. Once I, once I quote Woodrow Wilson, the situation I will get in. Is oh, that, I know you, my exactly. Condolences? You know, you should. Uh, yes, yes, you'd have to say Woodrow Wilson, comma, citing Frederick Douglass, comma, <laughs> once said. <that> <laughs> should we have some questions? Sure, or whatever. Yes, we can have questions, of course, sir. Common Core, or something like it, whatever you want to call it, that's politically charged, is very essential in undergraduate education, mm -hmm. so that a science major has not only an exposure to the humanities, but gains a solid understanding of the humanities. And a humanities major gets a solid understanding of science and technology. And I think that's very, very important, and I don't see it happening in a lot of schools. That sounds like that was directed at me. You start, and then I'll say one thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me say, in principle, I agree completely with what you're saying. And at Harvard, we just revised the, the undergraduate requirements. Uh, we do update them from time to time. And there is a real commitment on the part of the faculty to making sure we have broadly educated students so that scientists do do work in the humanities and humanists do do work in the sciences. It's very hard with so much knowledge in this day and age to define what an explicit core curriculum will be. We have peer institutions that continue to do that. University of Chicago, Columbia do have a very defined core. We let our students roam a little more broadly, not having come to a agreement about which two dozen books or which particular works of art are necessary. Rather, we let students choose among a, a wider range of opportunities. We also ask them to take what we call general education courses, where the course is specifically designed to introduce students to certain concepts of learning. And so they do have that common experience, but that's less to be expert in every part of humanistic or scientific learning. So it's challenging to operationalize what you say, exactly which course would do it, which assignment would do it. But in general, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why I defend the liberal arts so vigorously, because I believe in the purposes of, of what you're advocating. I would add that, um, first I would say that I think that it is the case that the level of scientific literacy in this country is deplorable, uh, and that needs to be corrected. But it doesn't need to be corrected so as to usurp or displace the humanities. What I see, I do not, I see scientistic imperialisms against the humanities. I do not see humanistic imperialisms against the sciences. That is to say, I see all sorts of scientists telling me that uh, 
that art and love and courage and beauty can all be explained in genetically or, uh, or in terms of Darwinian evolution or economically and so on. I do not see humanists going to biologists or economists and telling them that really what they're practicing is Dante studies. Um, and I think that since we live in all these realms, we have to make ourselves intellectually competent in all the realms in which we live. But I think the fundamental principle has to be that no single realm has the right to usurp any other realm, and that none of the categories and uh, notions that are methods that are appropriate to one realm necessarily belong in all the realms. Uh, so that, you know, and, and even, you know, the question of what is the place of science in life, that is not a scientific question. That is a humanistic question. It's, it had, there is no biological answer for what the place of biology is. That's for philosophers and thoughtful people. And so I think that, once again, one has to be ferocious uh, and vigilant in defense of the humanities because essential capacities will be lost. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the one who thinks it isn't you. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi there. Um, I'm a French teacher, and I have a question that's going to relate a little bit more to leading up to the university education at the secondary level. I just spent five years teaching in a private Catholic school in Arizona for French. And my question is, how can educators like myself that lead students into the university setting, how can we work to promote the humanities? And I think that the comment about the utilitarian values of the humanities and encouraging students to get involved in them, we do run into some limitations. Obviously, I get a lot of students that want to be lawyers and doctors. That's what their parents are. And they really want to achieve certainly some type of, I, I think, an income bracket. So how can, as educators, especially at the secondary level, how can we promote um, and really encourage our students to pursue uh, a career or even a degree and then beyond that an interest in the humanities? One of the things that I think is absolutely fundamental to success in any field in this day and age is the ability to communicate clearly and the ability to analyze and distinguish signal from noise or nonsense from reason. And that's something that I think learning to write, reading in order to understand how communication most effectively takes place, all of that is essential. You also say you're a teacher of French looking at the world from different eyes and different perspectives is critical as well for students who are likely to operate well beyond their own communities and even their own nation. So how do we get outside ourselves is a big part of what the humanities offer a path towards. And also, how do we share what we believe or want to advocate for with others in the most effective way? And so what I say, whatever someone's doing, they need to have those two attributes, at least from, from the experience of the humanities. I would say make it exciting to them. And when I say make it exciting to them, if you're talking about high school students, teach them the humanities that pertain directly to their lives, meaning teach them the art and the literature that have to do with love and erotic experience and friendship and, and parents and children. It's a Catholic school, so we do a little less erotic experience. <laughs> well, well, what about, well, hold on, hold on. There are, there are extracurricular activities. I mean, it's just, it's just um, I remember that from my Jewish school, so it's just, a, um, though I bet we had it a little easier than you did, but never mind. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Hey, Phil. Um, so when we look at sort of the history of European education, uh, we see this sort of emphasis on early career choice. You're going, you know, law, accounting, what, whatever. Um, and we see in the U.S., in the East Coast schools, the uh, schools like Harvard, and they come out of a different tradition. Uh, which tradition actually is changed as we get to the land grant schools that you know happen after the civil war etc much more professionally oriented job oriented you know hotel management etc you you can see those schools my question is to what extent does a sense of abundance both psychological and economic have to do with this shift 
uh, and from my, I'm talking primarily about the elite schools, the shift to sort of utilitarianism, uh, jobism, et cetera, with the loss of a sense of psychological and economic abundance, and therefore the feelings of necessity and scarcity mm -hmm. as a driver. Mm -hmm. Our students today feel enormously stressed about what will their place in the world be, and will they be able to find work that is remunerative as well as meaningful? How are they going to sort themselves out while they're in college to be on the best possible trajectory in a world that seems hostile in many ways? And we read everywhere that this generation of Americans is likely to have less prosperity than their parents. This has a very definite effect on our students. Mm -hmm. And we also have different students now. At Harvard and many of our peers, we have a much more open policy about economic circumstances of our applicants. We are giving much more financial aid. We have many more students who are not just in college representing themselves. They're there for their whole family or their whole community. And the burden they feel is that they have got to, they're often sending part of their scholarship money home even while they're in college to help their families because they feel guilty about being away from situations where they can give more direct help. And they plot out their lives as people responsible for much more than themselves. So I think what you describe as a sense of scar uh, scarcity or uncertainty has affected our students very broadly and does contribute to the vocational nature of so many of their interests, to majoring in something that isn't the humanities and then minoring possibly in the humanities or maybe not taking much humanities at all. Part of my utilitarian response to that is to try to point out how the humanities are helpful and how many of our alumni who are most successful actually majored in humanities fields and that this is not an impediment to a career but often an enhancement of career possibilities. But in saying all this, I can give permission to the students who are looking for it, but I'm struggling against a wall of counter advice mm -hmm. from society more broadly and from often from families. I mean, I think that we, I want to say something that's <laughs> almost completely hopeless to say and is deeply heretical to say here at Aspen, which is we have got to stop talking about achievement. Um, we, you know, college used to be a time Th these were at least, okay, never mind your senior year, but you had two or three years in which society kind of insulated you mm -hmm. from certain kinds of pressures so that you were not supposed to be 19 years old thinking about McKinsey. You were supposed to be 19 years old and not knowing what McKinsey is. And you had this period in which you could read and think and reflect on experience and grow, if you'll pardon that cliche. Eventually, you would have to come into society. You would have to find that you'd have to earn a living. You'd have to contribute to society. All this was the case, too. But there is some way in which we have poorly served our young people by either by, 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 in, by introducing these worldly considerations into their minds at such an obscenely young age. Um, they, don't, they don't have the, the, you know, the mind and the soul, if you'll pardon the expression, needs time to form. And it can only form by means of education. And it cannot be adequately formed by means solely of vocational education or pre-professional education. Um, so there is, when I, when I lecture on campuses or teach, one of the things that always depresses me is the premature sophistication of my students. In other words, I'm, they're very smart and they, they talk mm -hmm. like some of the people I know in Washington who are in their 50s, but they're in their 20s. And I don't want them to talk that way yet. I actually want to give them a little time in which they could, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the cult of achievement, and my wife will be very happy to hear me say this, the cult of achievement really has been uh, exaggerated, exaggerated. Um, there will be time for achievement, but, et cetera, et cetera. Sir, yeah. Sure. yeah. <clears throat> um, a couple, couple of questions. No, First, just one. I know one. <laughs> In the old days, back when the humanities you know, had a much larger percentage of the majors, wasn't that a time when just going to college kind of gave you the leg up? And then as, there, as college became much more prevalent, 
people felt as though they needed a, a little bit higher leg up. But at the same time, with the advent of grad schools, business law especially, um, can't the um, counselors preach humanities as a major, know, knowing that you'll go to law school to get your, quote, vocation? And why isn't that helping with the humanities majors? Well, with law school, one of the issues now is a fear on the part of many students that law, a law degree right. is just more learning that is going to end you up not with a job or not with the kind of position yeah. you want to have. So nationwide applications. Law is becoming part of the humanities. humanities. Yes. <laughs> nationwide applications to law school have plummeted. Mm -hmm. um, for people going to business or into business or into business school, Often they feel they need to major in economics or someone going to medical school feels I need to major in chemistry. We try to point out that that isn't necessarily the case mm -hmm. and that it's certainly possible to choose an undergraduate major in the humanities and be ready for business school, be ready for law school. Uh, so we try to make that case, but I think people start getting nervous and think I've got to start building this. Leanne was just saying, start building my resume the minute yes. I get, now I've gotten into college, now I've got to get ready for the next hurdle to, to vault over, so I better make sure I have all the courses that mm -hmm. will look best to mm -hmm. polish me for a particular path. Yeah. Uh, people now take a gap year sometimes, and I wondered if there's a way of promoting a gap semester or a gap year devoted to the humanities instead of just traveling or whatever else they might do. Focus. That's a really interesting idea. I'd argue that traveling could indeed be a gap year devoted to the, to the humanities. Well, traveling is a humanistic experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the mm -hmm. classical humanistic experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young Werther, right? Back there? Up. Yeah, you. Um, earlier you mentioned that uh, minorities tend to, or you would think that they would study more philosophy. Um, and humanities because I can say for myself that we do, um, we, we look back at the text, we stick to songs, you know, being an activist, I do a lot of this stuff. Um, but coming from a family as well of immigrants, uh, I think that we tend to study more in the STEM field because we want to, mm -hmm. you know, we want to prove to our families mm -hmm. that we can be somebody or even society, you know, become a doctor, become a scientist mm -hmm. and actually go back and help our families. Um, my question is, have you seen a decline um, in what we are as labeled as a minor minority? Have you seen a decline um, of people studying in humanities? And what are you doing to reaching out to, this, um, to minorities to study more humanities instead of having to go back um, and in a way prove to society that even though we are here as immigrants, um, that we can still be somebody um, as a scientist, as a doctor, and be able to help our communities? Well, it's not an either or. I mean, don't ever think of it that way. Um, it, would make, it would make perfect sense for an immigrant to want to find a vocation that would not just provide economic security, but would contribute to the society. And it would make perfect sense for an immigrant, and I am the son of immigrants myself, of refugees, to want to find an education that would enable her to make sense of the experience of displacement and dislocation and tradition and modernity and all the things that immigrant experience is made of. So I guess what I'm saying is that you have to fulfill both. Because, I mean, you have to fulfill both. And as I said earlier, people who are experiencing economic urgency or social marginality or, um, or downright adversity or oppression, um, actually are people more in need of being able to reflect upon these things and being able to teach their children about these things, right? I mean, I have to teach my son about his grandparents' experience, which was very nasty. And he asks questions. And I have to be competent in the discourse that will allow me to discuss thoughtfully suffering, pain, hardship, oppression, persecution, all dislocation, all these things. Um, so it's not just about the Metropolitan Museum of Art at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. It really isn't just about that. I mean, it is for some people, but that's, not, that's almost trivial. I would say that um, history imposes, as you know, 
History imposes a great deal on immigrants and on immigrant families, and it requires a lot of them. Uh, but that also makes them stronger people and richer people because they have more inner resources because they need more inner resources. And so what I would say to you is that it's not either or. It's not, and, and of course, what we're not saying is that any, everybody who wants to go to graduate school in law and medicine should go to graduate school in comp lit. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that by the time you get to the point in your life where you make professional decisions and launch yourself into the world according to the rules of the world into which you're launching yourself, you should have acquired in your undergraduate or even high school years some degree of sensibility and thoughtfulness and so on that only the humanities can provide. Um, because there isn't anyone on the planet, immigrant, not immigrant, rich, poor, who doesn't have a solemn responsibility to lead a meaningful life and be a thoughtful individual. Nobody is exempt from that, right? Maybe Donald Trump. Maybe <laughs> Donald Trump. But otherwise, nobody is exempt from that. So. Okay, and then Michael. Yeah, go. I am surrounded by a culture of tiger parents who of are what? I'm sorry. tiger parents uh, who are focused on creating highly achieving children. And when they hear this conversation, they are thinking to themselves, oh, perhaps we have to now put pressure on our children to excel at this new level as well as everything else they are doing. Um, and they are doing it. Um, to, to get into Harvard and to other universities. So how do you, what do you recommend to parents in terms of raising well-balanced children who can get into universities like Harvard and also uh, be well-balanced individuals? This is such a profound question for our age as we see the kind of pressures that students feel to get into colleges and bring with them when they arrive in colleges. And I think a lot of this resume building starts in, I don't know, fifth grade, maybe in kindergarten. And Actually, this, second trimester. You read to your, yes, yes, yes. your baby in utero. So it's something that extends well beyond the question of the humanities or the question of a university. And I think we all need to address it as a culture because I think it's child abuse to mm -hmm. start telling the baby in utero that this child has to have a certain path in life or mm -hmm. has to uh, succeed at some level that who knows if the little baby about to be born can even imagine. So how can we change the discourse in our society to open up more options? An important one of which is, of course, the humanities. I think that this kind of uh, Pressure may have differential impact on the humanities, but I think it diminishes all of students' opportunities to grow and thrive and be who they are meant to be. And to go back to the Woodrow Wilson quote that I'm not allowed to use, um, how do you make children different from their parents if their parents are so in control of what their lives will be? And, and so let's start a movement to liberate um, I, I think it's important to add that, I mean, you know, tiger parents are basically people in panic. <laughs> I mean, it's really just panic. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite pathetic. And, um, but it's very important to understand that in a child, that the depth of one's child matters more than the breadth of one's child. I really believe that. I've met lots of kids who can play the violin, speak Mandarin, have a terrific backhand, won the Westinghouse merit competition, um, have gotten into Harvard four times in a year, and so on. And then I look at them and I think, well, that's all very nice. At best, they're just good dinner party guests, right? So one has to be very clear about what is or is not accomplished by this kind of empty versatility mm -hmm. that parents try to impose on children. What matters to me about my own child is that there be a few areas, important ones, in which he's actually deep. And if he's on the baseball team and doesn't play in the games, which happens to be the case, that's fine with me. That's fine. I mean, the, the, you know, this is the, 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 the idea, what did a friend of mine once call it? He called it excellence at its best. Um, I hate excellence at its best because it's empty, it's hollow. Um, you, one wants to, you know, one wants soulful children, and soulfulness is the very opposite 
of, if you had to, all, all human things can be put on a resume between soulfulness at this end and resume at that mm -hmm. end, right? And I, I just would say further, I think your point comes back to the point made by the gentleman here about the pressures and the, the feeling of, of desperation that so many people um, confront. And so it's, it's much wider than any group or set of uh, geographic locations or anything else. It's really something in our culture that is, is putting enormous pressure on Absolutely. kids to Absolutely. a very negative effect, ultimately, yes. as they either burn out or make choices that they're not happy That's with. Right. One final question, Mike. So I, I just want to make sure I understand the, 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 what we're talking about when we talk about humanities here, because it doesn't sound much like, I've been teaching humanities classes for 30, 40 years now, um, doesn't sound like the humanities classes that I see around me. It sounds like not just the Met on a Sunday afternoon, but taking uh, a bath in great books and listening to what you would think of as great music, um, and uh, that really bears very little relationship to the humanities at universities. Mm -hmm. But I, I do wonder why you think, if you do, that having such a uh, uh, immersion in these great old books and great old music makes you a better, more empathic person. I, I, you know, I, I just don't see uh, among my colleagues and friends who have spent their lives with books and music uh, that much, might, but I have a small sample, you know, it's only decades. Um, uh, can you think of a single cultural moment in the last few hundred years where you, you see a culture that has a deeper immersion in these good old books and great old music and then behaves better? Because well, it does sound look, like you think we just get better by reading good books. The, the, the sardonic tone in your thing about good old books and good old, it's, I mean, don't make fun of it because they're disappearing. And it's not just as hoary and boring and grandfatherly as all that. Um, new books and new works of art and new pieces of music can also provide stimulations. Um, when Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, it was not an old book, it was a new book. And it had an enormous impact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, so I, to start with, it's not as dull as all that. Secondly, as I said earlier, and we didn't get into this, I have my own complaints with what humanists have done to the humanities in the last 30 or 40 years. I think that some of the fundamental objectives of humanistic education have been replaced by all sorts of philosophical and theoretical and political objectives that have distorted the instruction and changed the curriculum in a way that does no, no longer exposes kids to certain things that I think actually are transformative. When I speak about the transformative experience of those books, I actually speak from personal experience. I actually speak from personal experience. I went to Columbia, and without Columbia's core requirements, I would be nothing. I have to tell you. I would be a coarse, poorly educated, morally miserly, um, unimaginative individual. <laughs> My Jewish tradition helped somewhat, but I have to tell you that even as I was studying those things, I felt what was happening inside me. I felt the excitement, I felt the broadening out, I felt significant to my culture, I felt significant to my society, I felt empowered. But, not, but genuinely empowered, spiritually empowered. So I think that these things really are possible. Now, th does the teaching of the humanities in contemporary universities provide that experience? Maybe not. If not, then my question would be to, to those teachers, and I would like to have a discussion about old ways and new ways of teaching humanities and what counts as texts and what doesn't. And I'm not being fundamentalist about this. I'm not being fundamentalist about this. I mean, in, uh, you know, if people want to find, if people want to find these experiences in new things, in new media and new forms of production, fine. I mean, the point is there isn't any, every medium, every medium is capable of both sublimity and bullshit. Every medium, right? the novel, poetry, philosophy, history, um, video art, oil painting, you can either do great things or terrible things in it. And if great things are being done in any medium, then, then I am for providing that kind of stimulation to young people. And that would be an interesting conversation. 
Um, but what we're not talking about is you know, finding our way back to Mortimer Adler when everything was good and clear and so on. In fact, everything wasn't good and wasn't clear even then, as you know. So th I, I think that's how I would answer that. And we have to wind up, but if I could just add a kind of higher education dimension to this. I think we have to be sure to sustain our commitment to a space in higher education and the importance of a space in higher education for asking questions that don't necessarily have ready answers, for enabling students to take the appetite they bring for this kind of exploration of the largest dimensions of human experience and assure them that this is a worthwhile enterprise and that we care that they live meaningful lives in which they use their intelligence and what they learn in their minds to inform their hearts and their, their lives in the world. And that seems to me what we're deeply committed to in this project. Thank, Thank you, very you very much for coming. Thank you.